An interesting thing to observe in nature is the coming together, which is known as a confluence, of two mighty rivers to become one. In some cases, the contrast between the color and the temperature of each, of each is very different and very distinct. It allows for a period where they flow side by side without mixing, and sometimes that takes miles before it happens. We have two rivers right down uh, the street there that come together. They're not all that different, and you can, you can see the difference, but not by much. These are just a couple of examples of the ones around the world where they're very different when they come together. <clears throat> when, ah, when two very different rivers come together, it isn't clear beforehand which of the two res of the risen, which of the two the resulting combination is going to resemble more. We see this same phenomenon phenomenon in the genetics of children. Are they going to look like their mother? Are they going to look like their father? Are they going to act like mom? Are they going to act like dad? We don't know that ahead of time. In our text today, two very distinct families have come together. The pious and faithful Jehoshaphat of Judah and the wicked idolater Ahab of Israel. Their children have been united in marriage. So will Jehoshaphat's son be faithful like his father, or will he follow the evil practices of his father-in-law Ahab and his mother-in-law Jezebel? So beginning in 2 Chronicles 21, the first three verses, it says, Then Jehoshaphat rested with his fathers and was buried with them in the city of David. And Jehoram, his son, succeeded him as king. Jehoram's brothers, the son of Jehoshaphat, were Azariah, Jehiel, Zechariah, uh, Azariah, Michael, and she Shephatiah. All these were the sons of Jehoshaphat, king of Israel. Their father had given them many gifts of silver and gold and articles of value, as well as fortified cities in Judah. But he had given the kingdom to Jehoram because he was his firstborn son. Just a note, it doesn't help you ahead of time to look at names like that when you read them out loud, uh, because it's still, you still got to pronounce them when you get to them. First thing we hear is that Jehoshaphat has passed. He is buried with his fathers, and his son succeeds him as king. We've seen this kind of transitional text usually at the start of a chapter before. Jehoshaphat succeeded his father Asa on the throne a few chapters ago. Asa succeeded his father Abijah on the throne, all the way back to Rehoboam and Solomon and David. As this chapter then begins, there's nothing unusual about the first verse. Unfortunately, that normalcy, normalcy is going to fade very quickly. Now we're told something interesting. We're told about all the names of Jehoram's six brothers. We don't normally see listed in historical writings like Chronicles the names of the younger siblings of a king. And when we do, it will become, it is clear that those names are going to be significant. The people are important for some reason. The author of Chronicles, which is Ezra, wrote 400 years after the fact about these events. He, just, he thought that it was important that the names of each of Jehoram's six brothers be remembered by his people. In a moment, we'll know why. Now, we're told that Jehoshaphat gave each of those six younger brothers many gifts, and he set them up to be governors of various fortified cities in Judah. There, Jehoshaphat is following the example of his great-grandfather, Rehoboam, who dispersed his sons throughout the realm both to have loyal people administering the realm and to forestall any rivalry for his firstborn who will inherit the throne. Now this action also is not unlike what Abraham did. Abraham was willing to send Ishmael away to make sure he didn't compete with Isaac for the inheritance. In that case, it was on the assistance of Isaac's mother, Sarah. When Jehoshaphat died, the kingdom was thus set up properly. We are ready to transition to the next generation. There should be no reason why Jehoram shouldn't have a successful reign, as had the six generations of his family before him. There is nothing untoward at this point. And yet we have this at the end of the third verse. But he had given the kingdom to Jehoram because he was the firstborn son. This sentence should fill us with trepidation and foreboding. 
Why say anything about Jehoram being the firstborn? That should be an, entire, an entirely unremarkable piece of information. With the exception of Solomon, who was not the firstborn, because David's firstborn Absalom had rebelled against him, all the kings of Judah had been the firstborn son. It was standard, standard practice, basically all over the world throughout history, that a firstborn son succeeds his father on the throne. That's exceedingly normal. The only time we hear of some departure from that custom is when there is no child of the king when he dies, or when the king has no sons, he only has daughters, or when the firstborn decides to rebel because he's just getting tired of dad living so long. That was about the only time it's not normal for the firstborn son to be the next king. You would never say, but, at the beginning of this sentence, because it's expected by everyone, including his younger brothers, that Jehoram is going to be the next king. The but comes from Ezra, who is writing history and knows the normal custom, excuse me, knows why he needs to remind the reader that Jehoshaphat is following the normal custom when he names Jehoram as his heir. Ezra needs to remind the reader of this, even though it is a well-known custom, because the blame for what happens next should not fall on Jehoshaphat. At least that's what Ezra is telling us. So what happens in verse 4? When Jehoram established himself firmly over his father's kingdom, he put all his brothers to the sword, along with some of the princes of Israel. That's why we need to see the but. This is shocking villainy. This is on the scale of Shakespeare's Macbeth or Richard III. To see such barbarism from the son of Jehoshaphat is as upsetting as it is sobering. How could a man raised in such a godly household abandon everything God stands for and kill his own brothers in cold blood? It doesn't help much to know that history is full of such stories of infighting amongst brothers and various family members for power. I could give you historical examples from pretty much every monarchy and dictatorship that has ever existed in pretty much every country in the world. This thing kind of thing happened a lot. The lust for and the fear of losing power creates distrust and paranoia. It is a recipe for mistrust amongst brothers that has ended up in many murders like this one. But those other examples would be stories for the most part that didn't involve households known for their devotion to the Lord. To see such violence amongst brothers is tragic no matter when or where or why it occurs. But to see it from the son of a man who devoted his life to the Lord is heartbreaking. This is the fear that keeps parents up at night, wondering if their attempts to instill virtue and love in their children will be enough, hoping that their faith in God will be their children's faith as well. Sadly, we know it doesn't always work. Some children raised in a loving home with two parents who honor God choose to walk away from that example. Whether it be all the way to a life of, of wickedness or simply just drifting away from God and walking away from His church. We know that this happens. One of the hardest things that I've ever done was speak at my grandmother's funeral while I was in college. It was hard because I was very close to her, it was hard because of what I had to say. I spoke at that funeral about her desire to see her children and her grandchildren walk with the Lord, because they all weren't. Some were, but many were not. Fortunately, in the decades that have happened since that funeral, more of them, by God's grace, have become followers of Jesus Christ, but not all. It's a very difficult topic to talk about in a family. In the end, we don't know why some people who are given all the benefits of an example of love and faith reject it. Just as we don't know how some, on the other hand, who have known only neglect or abuse in their life, find the grace of God. We don't know how that works. We don't understand it. 
This is a mystery of human free will and the grace of God, and we will not solve it. Our solemn task, then, is to prepare the next generation as best we can. And in light of that, to keep open doors, hoping that prodigal children return someday. To welcome with open arms all those who do find their way home to God for forgiveness. No matter if they started out with an advantageous or a disadvantageous beginning to life. So whatever it was that compelled Jehoram, whether it was his wife, or his own irrational paranoia, or simply his lust for power, whatever it was, he chose to abandon God by murdering his brothers. And there will be consequences, both for, for, both for Jehoram and for the entire kingdom. But notice also in this verse that Jehoram didn't limit his purge to just his brothers. He also killed others, probably anyone who with a remote claim to the throne, maybe his cousins, maybe his uncles, anyone that was a threat to him. Thus in this purge, Judah was robbed of many potential leaders who might have helped them resist the other evil choices that Jehoram was about to make. Let us pick it up in verses 5 through 7. It says this. Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem eight years. He walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, as the house of Ahab had done, for he married the daughter of Ahab. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Nevertheless, because of the covenant the Lord had made with David, the Lord was not willing to destroy the house of David. He had promised to maintain a lamp for him and his descendants forever. Here we see the wickedness of man and the grace of God side by side. We're told that he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. He took after Ahab and followed his ways. We began this message with the metaphor of the confluence of two rivers. It is clear from Jehoram's murder of his brothers that the influence of Ahab through his daughter has entirely overcome the influence of his good father, Jehoshaphat. Jehoram has chosen to walk away from the devout influence of, excuse me, from devotion to God that his father had spent so much time and effort cultivating in his people. He has replaced that with idolatry and embraced the wet methods of their kindred to the north. We're told that he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. We already know that from what he did to his brothers. His father had made a mistake by arranging his marriage to Ahab's daughter. We can see that now. His grandfather had let pride cloud the end of his life. Rehoboam, Solomon, David, they had all made grave mistakes in life. But Jehoram has gone much, much further because he lacks anything good or moral to hold back the wrath of God. All of his choices have been to embrace wickedness. Some of the blame undoubtedly belongs to that of to his wife and her influence. But Jehoram is the one who bears the guilt for his own actions. He is the one who will answer to God for them. And now we see this. Nevertheless, because of the covenant the Lord had made with David. When we saw the but back in verse 3, it was ominous. When we see the nevertheless here in verse 7, it is a lifesaver. Up until this point, it seemed as if one man's evil could undo entirely six generations worth of devotion to the Lord. If such a ratio were true, if one could undo six, how could we have any hope in the future? Humanity is sadly not often capable of avoiding men like Jehoram. We will have people like this in our families, in our church, in our society, in our community. People who are willing to destroy the good works that others have done before. If we were on our own, only relying upon humanity's good to outweigh its evil, we wouldn't have much hope. Thankfully, God here intervenes with a nevertheless that doesn't depend upon humanity. It depends upon his own promise, his own fidelity. And so we do find hope, even in the midst of the evil perpetuated by men like Jehoram. Even then, we find hope. 
God had previously promised to David, swearing that his love would never be taken away from David's descendants, that his throne would be established forever. From the outside, it looks as if Jehoram is capable of destroying everything his ancestors held dear. But he isn't, because God's love and mercy are greater. The devotion shown by David to God prompted God to respond far beyond what David had earned. Now, because of Jehoram, that promise is being put to the test. And we're told that God was not willing to destroy the house of David. Jehoram, he had no qualms about destroying the work of his father and blackening the reputation of the house of David. Jehoram tried to destroy it himself. If that lineage and previous devotion to God had meant anything to him, he wouldn't have adopted the idolatrous ways of Ahab, and he certainly wouldn't have murdered his brothers. He didn't care anything about the house of David. Yet God is not so quick to walk away from the memory of those who have been devoted to him. David's heart was fully devoted to God, even with, we know, the brutal involvement that David had in the complicit complicit and being complicit in murder, being an adulterer, because his heart was broken before God after that in repentance. He had climbed high before it in God's sight, and then he had fallen to the depths. But when God was in, but when he repented, God was able to lift him back up. He turned from sin and once more embraced righteousness. The word of God, his promises confirmed in his own name, is not capable of being overturned. God cannot be forced to keep his word, but he doesn't need to be, because he will never break it. Therefore, the promise to David stands. No matter how much evil Jehoram embraces, because it does not depend upon man's goodness or wickedness, it depends upon God's faithfulness. And he had promised to maintain a lamp for him and his descendants forever. In Judah, during the reign of Jehoram, the, dark, the darkness was very dark indeed. But a light remained that could not be snuffed out. As long as that light remains, so does hope. There will be more dark days ahead as we continue in Second Chronicles, as well as some good ones in the generations to come. But through it all, the light will continue to shine until one day the words of the prophet Isaiah are fulfilled through a descendant of David. Isaiah wrote, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. To us a child is born, to us a son is given, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He will reign on David's throne. God will not allow the lamp to fail, because it is through this line of kings that the Messiah will one day reconcile the world to God. God's loyalty to David and his promises to him should help us all to have hope, even when our own situations seem hopeless. Because the evil of one man, or even a whole generation, as powerful as it may be, still pales in comparison to the staying power of the righteous deeds performed by God's power from one man, or one woman, or even one child. When God's people unite in service to his kingdom, no power of darkness can withstand them. As Christ predicted of his church, the very gates of hell will not be able to stand against it. Getting back to Jehoram and what happened to him, verses 8 through 11. In the time of Jehoram, Edom rebelled against Judah and set up its own king. So Jehoram went there with his officers and all his chariots. The Edomites surrounded him and his chariot commanders, but he rose up and broke through by night. To this day, Edom has been in rebellion against Judah. Libna revolted, revolted at the same time because Jehoram had forsaken the Lord, the God of his fathers. He had also built high places on the hills of Judah and caused the people of Jerusalem to prostitute themselves, and he had led Judah astray. 
We hear about rebellion against Judah, Edom, and Libna, the city, both because he had forsaken the Lord. Cities and kingdoms in tribute to other cities and empire, kingdoms and empires revolted all the time. It's common, very common in history. But Ezra sees the revolt of Edom and Libna as a direct result of the rebellion of Jehoram against God. If Jehoram will not be loyal to God, why should God support the aspirations of his kingdom? That which his ancestors built up through wisdom and toil, he tosses away simply by rejecting God. The sins of the king affect the kingdom. Those in charge of a nation or a business, a church or a family, bear much responsibility both for good or ill, for what happens to it during their stewardship. Jehoram's sinfulness spilled over into his kingdom's political fortunes. We're told that he had caused the people of Jerusalem to prostitute themselves when he led Judah astray. The relationship between God and his people is most often described as that of a husband and wife or a father and a child. Here we're talking about the husband and wife analogy. For Jehoram to embrace other gods is not akin to a divorce. For God's covenant with his people cannot be revoked. There is no divorce. It is instead the sordid and exploitative use of a prostitute. The relationship between God and his people should be pure, but by serving other gods it has been defiled. This is the very first commandment given to Moses on Mount Sinai. You shall have no other gods before me. God will not tolerate a cheating spouse. He will not share his love for his bride with a prostitute. To try to have God and other gods will not work. In our own modern world, with the notable exception of Hinduism, monotheism has been triumphant. The majority of the people in the world who believe in God also believe that there can only be one God. There will be some Christians living in India or places where tribal religions still remain that are tempted to try to make Jesus one of their gods. And of course there will be Christians in Muslim lands tempted to keep their devotion to Jesus a secret and worshiping Allah publicly out of fear. But that's not our temptation here in America. That is not our problem, is that we have too many gods. The church in the West is not in danger of prostitution with other gods. Our failing is different. Our failing is not seeking that, is not that of seeking another partner but rather that of neglecting to be devoted to the one that we already have. What happens to Jehoram, verses 12 through 15, the consequences for him? Jehoram received a letter from Elijah the prophet which said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, the God of your father, David, says. You have not walked in the ways of your father Jehoshaphat, or of us, a king of Judah, but you have walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, and you have led Judah and the people of Jerusalem to prostitute themselves, just as the house of Ahab did. You have also murdered your own brothers, members of your father's house, men who were better than you. So now the Lord is about to strike your people, your sons, your wives, and everything that is yours with a heavy blow. You yourself will be very ill with a lingering disease of the bowels until the disease causes your bowels to come out. Holy cow. A letter from Elijah the prophet. Pretty unusual for a prophet to send a letter instead of coming in person. But in this case, it's unavoidable. If we understand the chronology of First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles correctly, and I think we do, Elijah has already been taken up to heaven in the fiery chariot by the time this letter is delivered. So he really can't give it himself. So he sends a letter instead before he goes. And this is what the word of the Lord is. He reminds him, the God of your father David is saying this. Jehoram may have decided to abandon God, but God is still God. We must still reckon with God, regardless of our own acknowledgement or lack thereof of his rule. It is also a reminder to Jehoram, right at the start of the letter, that his most famous, his most famous ancestor David had led the people toward God, not away from him. He gives us a recap of the things we've already seen. You led the people 
away from God to prostitution. We already know that Jehoram turned from the devotion of his father and his grandfather to embrace the wickedness of his father-in-law, and that in doing so he led his entire kingdom along the same path of self-destruction. The words of the prophet Elijah confirm the commentary of the author Ezra and heighten the dread of the upcoming consequences for Jehoram. We're also told that his brothers were better men than he was. The sad truth is that all six of Jehoram's brothers, as well as those other relatives that he had killed, would have all made better kings of Judah than he was. If any of them had been chosen for the throne by Jehoshaphat, things would not have ended up like this. Now we don't know if Jehoram displayed any of this vicious behavior until after his father had died. We don't know any of that, if there were clues or hints that Jehoshaphat should have seen. Perhaps he kept his murderous intent hidden deep away in his heart until he had the chance to do something about it. But it does illustrate for us the danger of giving somebody a position of power or authority based on anything other than that person being well qualified. We call that nepotism, when you favor your relatives for a position. It's a problem in government, in family businesses, in church leadership, and in all of those cases, cases it is a dangerous thing. Precisely because it is such a natural thing for us to do. It is natural for parents to want to help their children get a leg up, to have them skip the hard process of climbing the ladder and toiling to be in charge of something. Parents naturally want to give their kids a boost. Well, in the church, for example, whether it was in the medieval period when dukes were making their second son the bishop of this, or the priest of that, or perhaps in our modern setting, when churches are tempted to let the son of a pastor take over when he retires. The results are far more often a disaster than they are a blessing. Just because you are somebody's son or somebody's daughter does not mean you should be in charge. And here is what happens to Jehoram and his family because of his sins. He says he's going to strike your people, your sons, with a heavy blow. The irony, the great irony of Jehoram's willingness to murder his own brothers to secure his throne is that it will cost him nearly all of his family, both his sons and his wives. Those who choose to bathe themselves in the blood of innocent people cannot so easily get clean. Their own innocent family most often pays the price for this behavior. Now this may turn our stomachs to see, but once unleashed, rage and murder and pillaging and war and all their like cannot be so easily contained. Jehoram brought this on himself. And yet others are paying the price. We don't, we don't often view sin as being this serious. Until it blows up and hurts innocent people as well. But it is. And what happens to Jehoram? I have no idea what this thing is, but it sounds nasty. Whatever it was that must have been exceedingly painful to have this issue in his bowels, this disease... To ensure that the whole kingdom knew that it was God's hand upon Jehoram, this is the punishment against him. To linger with this, to have this day after day, lest the next king who sits on the throne after him doesn't pay attention and learn. The fulfillment of this judgment from Elijah, verses 16 to 20. The Lord aroused against Jehoram the hostility of the Philistines and of the Arabs who lived near the Cushites, they attacked Judah, invaded it, and carried off all the goods found in the king's palace, together with his sons and wives. Not a son was left to him except Ahaziah, the youngest. After all this, the Lord afflicted Jehoram with an incurable disease of the bowels. In the course of time, at the end of the second year, his bowels came out because of the disease, and he died in great pain. His people made no fire in his honor, as they had for his fathers. Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem eight years. He passed away to no one's regret, 
and was buried in the city of David, but not in the tombs of the kings. Yikes. We have the rebellion, the capture of, uh, of Jehoram's sons, and the looting of the palace. The Lord was not long in fulfilling his judgment that was spoken through Elijah. The people of Jerusalem suffer for their part in Jehoram's wickedness, and his family bears the brunt of God's retribution. Now, we often prefer to focus and think about God in the form of Jesus. He's cuddly, he's approachable, he's got children sitting around, and we love that version. We forget the holiness of God that brings about wrath and judgment, but we cannot. The reason why Jesus can invite all sinners to repent is that he was prepared to bear the totality of the wrath of God upon himself on the cross. The New Testament doesn't forget the wrath of God that we see in the Old Testament. It simply redirects that wrath from God's wayward children to the Son of God. Sin still has consequences, grave ones, even for those living by faith in God's grace. Being forgiven by God is not an excuse to indulge in sin. Things like this are the consequences. And not a son was left to him except Azaziah, the youngest. Well, the promise of God to preserve David's line is kept, but only with one. Notice that it took two years for him to die of this lingering pain. Two years. Even Ahab repented, at least a little bit, at least for a while, when he was confronted by the prophet. Evidently, Jehoram never does. Even though he had two years to contemplate the words of Elijah, two years of pain, and he doesn't do it. When he dies, his people make no fire in his honor. They don't care about him at all. He passed away to no one's regret. Imagine having them say that about you when you go. We do a lot of funerals. I do a lot of them, and I would begin to know how to speak at a funeral if that's how everybody felt about the person. No one was sad to see him gone. What would you say? The people followed Jehoram while he lived, but they abandoned him to a disgrace when he died, and they shed not a tear for him. And in one last symbol of the cost of his rejection of God, they refused to bury him next to his father and the rest of Judah's kings. But what do we take from a passage like this? We take a variety of things. This is certainly a story of disaster and woe all brought about by one man's rejection of God and righteousness and his corresponding embrace of idolatry and murder. It is a cautionary tale of a fall from grace, a father's legacy trampled upon and the next generation bearing the consequences. So what does it mean for us? First thing it reminds us is what we already know, that the wages of sin is death. Paul wrote those words and we believe them, but I think sometimes we forget how serious sin really is. Because we've been forgiven. We have not borne the full consequences of that which we have done. The church needs to start taking its vows seriously and keeping its marriage bed pure with Jesus Christ. Secondly, in light of that, we can never take for granted that faith is automatic in the lives of those that we introduce it to be they our friends, our family, or even our children. It is not automatic. Which leads us to the most important, the last thought. Never give up hope. Never stop praying for those who walk away from God. Because God will not forget your devotion to Him. And if they repent, they will be saved.